I, I would like to complain about Duolingo before we start. Complain about Duolingo? Complain about Duolingo. Who Man, would have thunk I it? don't think we should do this. Uh, well, the owl has already heard us. I, I think you should say no more. Your safety may be at risk. At the owl. <laughs> do you know what I do actually really like? I love how, uh, at least in the German course, there's kind of like in-jokes about the owl. Uh, like they say some things like, you know, Duo owns a plane or Duo earns billions. And you're kind of like, they, they've kind of really like memed this owl. I think that's really cool. They, they do that in Welsh as well. I think that's brilliant. I think that's really fun. Yeah. Uh, a good bit of because, banter. Because I think Dewey, D-E-W-I, is a Welsh name. And so they keep like referring to Dewey Lingo as a person in, in the Welsh course. <laughs> oh, as in like Mr. First Name Dewey, Second Name Lingo. Exactly. Brilliant. Go on, the Welsh yeah. people. I like that. Um, the thing I wanted to complain about. I really like Duolingo, but uh, there is massive discrepancies in the quality of courses on there. Um, oh yeah, like German is a class course. Like German's brilliant. To- yeah, tons of documentation, tons of examples, and it's really well interlinked. Yeah, and it, exactly, um, it's just really well constructed. Who would have thought? Constructed by Germans. Turns out <laughs> it's excellent. Um, but I was, I started doing the Irish one again in earnest um, recently, and the Irish one is just hot garbage. Like it's like it's an absolute disgrace. Like, and I just it it annoys me so much because I kind of want like our language to be represented correctly and talk correctly, but it's just it's broken. Um, and it's not. This isn't even a criticism from the point of like, oh, I wish they would introduce uh, a said grammatical feature at an earlier point. It's like my criticism comes from a point of like the audio does not match the words on screen. Like that level of broken. And it's like, mm. guys, what are we doing here? Like, what are we doing? And like, there's loads of things. Like, they 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 never at any point in the early courses uh, tell you what sounds the various orthographies make. You know, like that's so important, especially in a language that has like um, consonant mutation, initial consonant mutation. You need to know what the sounds mutate into. And for a person who has no background in Irish, just going like, oh yeah, in certain cases, there's a BH stuck before an F at the start of a word. But they don't tell you what that sounds like. And there's no accompanying audio. Like, it's just, it's awful. Like, it really is awful. And it just, I wish, god damn, I wish someone would just make it better. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not a, not a, a, a if, I think it's good for people who are trying to revisit the language. Like, if you did it in school or whatever, it, it can give you a bit of a leg up because yeah. you will have internalized a lot of those kind of things. Yeah. Um, like, I realized a few years ago, I didn't understand why some of the sounds sounded the way they did, but I knew that they did. Like, why S, why the, the character S is sometimes S and sometimes SH. Mm-hmm. Like I just, I just noticed one day. I was like, "Wait, why, why the hell is that?" And I looked at it for a while, and I figured out it was to do with the surrounding vowels. Sure. But I had internalized that; um, it had never been taught to me. But there's nothing, or there's very little in the Irish Duolingo course that will teach that to you, and you need to be explicitly taught that. Yeah. Um, approaching it as an adult or without immersion. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you need to have prior lo- uh, knowledge, uh, at least to some degree, in order to do that Irish course. And it's just, Mm -hmm. um, it's just terrible. A a positive point though, I will say that loads of times when I have become confused and was like, what even do you want from me here, Irish course? Um, I'd go into the forums and the forums generally are very good at clarifying. Like the people, the actual human beings in there uh, who ostensibly speak Irish, they're really good at clarifying it. Um, So it's not, it's not beyond hope, but it's just, it's just not good, man. And to the point where I'm like, I think I'm like, I'm just going to give up on it and I'm I'm just going to go out and buy school textbooks uh, Mm -hmm. that have accompanying audio material and just learn like old fashioned because it's just, yeah, it's just, you get nowhere with it. I went to a Kirkel Korda on Wednesday. Uh, Ich weiß nicht, was das heißt. (laughs) Was das bedeutet. (laughs) (laughs) Um... Oit to got in a kind Oscarelga, a glowered Oscarelga, Lakela. Oh, very cool. Circle, mar on March Circle. Oh, okay. 
August Cora conversation. Conversation. Uh, but what Bill just said there, folks, is that he went to a place uh, where loads of people just spoke Irish uh, together. I went to a conversation circle. A conver- a circle of conversation. <laughs> how was it? Um, it was pretty good. I was happy with how I spoke, yeah. I I uh, managed to, to, to understand most of what was said to me, and I made myself pretty well understood, and I learned a couple of new things so yeah it was good yeah i'm i think i'm going to do something similar i looked into it uh but the there is a good uh kind of like um irish meetup in in town that happens on a friday uh but that's also the same day as swimming and it's at the same time so it's like oh nuts um but at the moment i'm getting by with just listening to podcasts completely osquilga and mm-hmm. just struggling to understand what's going on, but slowly getting there. Um, That's real good. Can you send me a few links? Uh, yeah, it, I'll, I'll tell you straight on the show, in case anyone does want to work on their Irish. It's called, uh, one I listened to was Bjor Egan. Um, <laughs> and it's this uh, podcast, is three Irish women, uh, and they just they just talk. It's not a language learning podcast. Like So they're talking full tilt Irish, um, and they're talking just about random stuff. Um, so, but that that's that's been help that's been helping. Um, you should listen to Kneecap. Kneecap. What is Kneecap? Yeah. Kneecap. They're a, a rap group from Belfast who who rap like mostly in in Irish, like they, a little bit in English, and kind of they they kind of combine the two in ways as well. And it's it's a total gangster rap. It's it's all about like selling drugs in <laughs> Irish. I mean, great. It is do they really speak Irish though? That that Ulster dialect, man. That's that's a whole language in and on, in and on itself. Listen, we'll have absolutely no discrimination <laughs> against dialects on this podcast. That that is, no, that is entirely fair as long as we all admit that Connacht Irish is the one true Irish. End of period. That starts the show. <laughs> uh, but see, even the Connacht Irish, that's a bit of a misnomer because the Roscommon dialect doesn't exist anymore. Roscommon's in Connacht. Um, and that was that existed uh, until quite a bit into the 20th century, and one of the oh. one of the presidents was a was a speaker of, of Roscommon Irish, and he gave his inaugural address in it. And oh. it's one of the only recordings of it that exists. What's what's your man's name? Oh, I know that guy. Yeah, so the, the name's just gone out of my head now. I'm googling it. because oh, I remember noting and being on like he came from the west. What? Ah, yeah. I, I think it was Douglas remember. Hyde. Oh, of course, because the the big football pitch in Roscommon is called Douglas Hyde Park. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, for all the people who aren't Irish here, I'm really sorry. Uh, this this show is only going to get worse because at the very end we're going to talk about Irish elections. So just be prepared for a lot of Irishness in this show. Uh, <laughs> I'm not one bit sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I nor am I really. But when I think of like you know, we said the word Roscommon. Connacht, uh, Douglas Hyde. These words mean nothing to anyone uh, outside of Ireland. Um, but hopefully you're following along <laughs> to some degree. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, should we start the show? Let's. Let's. Oh, let's do an Irish. Oh, hold on. Let me. Let me. Let me do an Irish intro here. Um, uh, Falter Road, Gujian uh, Pod Crela Artifexian. Uh, What's Crela? Podcast Pod Crela. Hood Crayla, huh? Yeah, probably pronounced wrong, but that's what they say on Bio Reagan. Um Anyway, Faltero Gaji on Pud Crayla Artifexian. Uh, it's Misha Edgar Grumwald, aka Artifexian. Uh, Tom Galer on Shaw Lembokara Bill. Uh, Bill, Conestatatu. <laughs> uh, Tom Gama, August Uh Yeah, sure, Tom Gama. Uh, did that make sense, Bill? <laughs> Um, I think you probably should have said Falcher Roth rather than Falcher Roth. Oh yeah, sorry. I should have. Yeah, that that's fair. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, Irish. That's si- singular versus plural. I think Falcher Roth a stock. Um, yeah, which means welcome to you all. Welcome to you all. Cade me the Falcher Roth just to really <laughs> ham up the Irishness. God. <laughs> Uh, we got an email from an anonymous person um, about uh, Hollow Earth um, asking us, is there any uh, sciencey stuff I could say 
we could say about the hollow earth like how could you handle it in terms of gravity plate tectonics day night cycle etc um i can't really answer too much about those things but i wanted to bring up the my old kind of like mind-blowing point in that uh a infinite flat earth is visually equivalent to a hollow earth and i believe there is a video on the internet about this that i'll link uh made by who is it um what's your man isaac arthur made by isaac arthur he has some video to do with this um but it's uh it's this cool thing where if you have an infinite flat plane the way light works the way light is bent uh the infinite flat plane if you could see infinitely far would uh bend would look to kind of bend upwards and it would bend right upwards and up above your head and just never there'd be an infinitesimally small gap between the two ends per se of the infinite plane which is kind of just a a fun sort of like if we take uh physics to its uh uh, extreme logical conclusion we end up with uh, hollow a flat earth equals hollow earth sort of thing um huh. links links in the description of that video you should go check it out um in terms of like it, this is the same problem with like the, the actual flat earth theories that are on the internet like gravity just doesn't work in that situation in a hollow earth situation because if gravity did work it would collapse it down into a sphere um so there's yeah. no way of doing gravity you're going to have to invent some sort of mechanic maybe you could get away with saying centrifugal forces as in like you because of the way it's spun you are always pressed to the outside of the sphere uh the outside yeah. of the sphere being the inside edge of the hollow sphere if that makes sense um, yeah you're 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 pushed away and end up on the inside of the outer shell yeah yeah uh you probably get away with a uh, hand waving with that uh tectonic activity you could no, you can't. You also can't uh, really do that because then you need to have your plate swimming on some sort of liquid, um, and unless you have like an outer mantle, um, you can't really do plate tectonics. Um, day night cycle, you could do a, not really a day night cycle, but maybe like a, a bright dim cycle in that you, you could do a kind of what flat earthers propose, where you have the sun and the moon orbiting uh above the surface so internal to your sphere and then as the the sun moves away uh, from the observer there's less light coming at them so it would dim somewhat um and as it moves closer to be more light uh but that's that's not going to get you daylight cycles as well uh so tldr it's a fun thing to think about, but this is one of those things where you we shouldn't look to scientific realism you should just let your let your hand waving and your imagination run wild if you run want to run a hollow earth setup. I think it's fun to apply a certain level of realism, like as as flavor where it's interesting. Like what you said about centrifugal force, that is obviously going to be different according to latitude on the inside, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you'll be closer to the axis nearer the poles. So that's going to make a difference. So that could be a cool effect to have. That functionally, gravity is different based on how far north or south you are um so yeah i mean i think use it as a as a as a principle to to find things that are cool rather than as a fundamental foundational principle yeah um agreed for a day night you could i'm just thinking off the top of my head you could have a small sun um and a larger moon um both orbiting around a common center uh so you get so uh, instead of having a night you have an eclipse uh, yeah that's kind of sort of what i was advocating i just forgot to mention eclipses yeah <laughs> so it's like um, so there's a, a different body getting in the way um rather than just it being further away yeah that's fair that's fair um a, a kind of fun consequence of this, uh, if you do have the bodies orbiting around a common center inside the hollow sphere, is that the bodies will shrink in size as they move away from you, which is not a thing that we observe uh, on Earth. And that would make for kind of a cool sort of, like the concept of the sun shrinking and expanding uh, mm -hmm. is not something, it's kind of a fantastical sort of thing. So it might be something you want to play with. Yeah. Uh, hollow Earths. Very cool. Is it also inhabited on the outside? Uh, we'd have to ask Anonymous about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I I know there's uh, is a Pellucidar is the Edgar Rice Burroughs series, 
about a a hollow earth. I think it's I think it's called Pellucidar. And it's it's set on on our world, and a guy like tunnels into Hollow Earth. Yeah, Anonymous brings up a similar thing with the with the Nazis in World War Two, where they thought I heard this before as well that they thought that the Earth was hollow as well, that there was someone on the inside. Um, I don't know the exact details, but like um, it seems Hollow Earth theories do tend to revolve around there being someone on the outside as well. Yeah. Well, I I, th- I think some of them in real world history were like that, that we were on the outside and there was one on the inside. I think that one referred to um, in, in the email uh, that, that that Nazi project was that we were on the inside. Um, that we were on the inside? Yeah, because that, that's because the this, this is what they say here. Some Nazi crackpots believed that in World War Two, so they thought they could spy on the British with a teleboat with a telescope on Rugen Island because the Earth's curvature would be inverted. That only makes sense if we're on the inside. Oh, yeah, that, that's fair. That is fair. God, that's so weird. So then, like, would their, would their rationale for, like, the stars be, like, tiny pinpricks in the surface of a hollow sphere? Oh, who knows? Who knows? That's interesting. That's interesting. Um... But uh, but yeah, so that's 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 my my uh, thoughts, our thoughts on Hollow Earth. Do you have anything else to add to that? Um, I do not. I do not. So the next thing I have here is uh oh no, this person who I'll refer to him as Chris. Um, Chris sent in a a base sixteen number system, uh, which I uh, I'm going to link in the show notes because I I really like this. Um. Uh, open up the picture there, Bill, and see what what you think. The idea is like it. He's uh, he's. They are drawing on um, the notion that that I covered in the video, or that uh, sorry, conline critic uh, covered in in the video. In that base sixteen can be used to used to encode uh, strings of binary um, mm-hmm. more efficiently, so you can store larger numbers in the computer uh, more efficiently. And using this sort of idea, they've came up with this what I kind of like to call the rows. Uh, sort of pattern uh, whereby they have shapes that look like a four petaled flower you're looking down on top of the flower four petals and then you color in each petal per kind of uh, four digit binary byte representation and what's what I think is really cool about the system is that this person includes a long form and the short form of the numbers. And I always enjoy mm. that because it's the equivalent of someone proposing an alphabet and uh, showing us like a printed version and a script version. So I think that's really cool. Um, and I really I really enjoy it. I really like it. Uh, so you check out the show notes, have a look uh, at, at Chris's works. They're really cool. Yeah, uh, this is cool. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's easily compressed for binary, uh, as you say. And... Yeah, the, the long form and the short form. It's like, as you said, coming up with a script, but then it's like coming up with a, a cursive version of it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of what you're getting at. Uh, um, what this reminds me of is there's a, a writer called Neil Stevenson. Oh, you've um, brought him up before. Wait, hang on. Snow remi- Crash? Yes, that Yes, guy. yeah. 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 Um, so he has a series called uh, The Baroque Cycle, which is science fiction set in the late 16 early 1700s mm-hmm. um but like with the appropriate technology um so it's kind of science fiction from the point of view of what does technology and science do to a society and yeah it's it's, it's quite an interesting series um but there's there's one section in it where there's a, a secret message encoded in a, a piece of embroidery or cross stitch or something um, because the woman's native language, the one who does it, her native language has 16 letters. Uh, so she can encode that extremely easily in four stitches, depending on whether she goes over or under the, oh. the previous thing. Kind of like that. Um, and it's just I thought that was a neat little idea. Do you know what this reminds me of, Phil? Um, what does this remind you of? It reminds of? me of the Blind Boy podcast. Uh, a couple of months ago, he had a live podcast where he talked to a a woman who studied the history of African American hairstyles or maybe just African hairstyles uh, I think um oh I uh, think I did listen to that one I'm not, I I I don't listen to all of the live ones but I I think I heard that one and so th- what what was really cool if I remember correctly because it has been months since I heard this this person uh in the course of her studies 
um, found out that um, American hairstyle, uh, not American, sorry, African hairstyles um, were used uh, throughout history to encode messages in terms of like mm. how they were braided and how various knots were made in the various shapes. Um, and I just, I, like, I realize that's tangential to a base system based uh, 16 counting system. Uh, but when you mentioned like, you know, encoding messages in knots, basically in knitting, I was thinking about encoding messages in, in knots. Embroidery. Yeah, exactly. And Enco- but encoding messages uh, as knots in one's hair. Uh, so I might, yeah. if I can find that episode, I'll link it because it really was interesting. There was some good uh, world building yeah. fodder. And it's always good to learn about uh, non white culture, you know? Yeah. Actually, I, I, I'm pretty sure, now they described it more fully, I'm pretty sure I, I did listen to that one. Yeah, it was a good one. It was good. It was really good. Um, so yeah, thank you, Chris, for, for that. It was a cool system. And again, really enjoy the uh, long form and short form. I really love that. It's good attention to detail. Uh, 10, 12 out of 12. 16 out of 16, even. <laughs> um, so another thing that came up in email, real quick, I'm, I won't talk about it too much, but uh, uh, Samuel DeBarber, Send us a link to a, is it a Kickstarter? Is it an Indiegogo? I think it's it's an Indiegogo for a new calendar, a new improved modernized calendar. Someone has been watching my videos <laughs> and they have said, hey, we can make these calendars fit better. And they are proposing a, a, a new, more uh, rigid calendar where things are more even etc um and you can go support it and you end up getting some some swag or whatever uh but check out the indiegogo page just for like how they did it like the decisions they made in terms of like like they have to create an extra season uh to make things fit evenly <laughs> uh, which which you know what i'm actually not i'm actually that that, that doesn't bother me bill <laughs> bill <laughs> Oh, lousy you, smart weather. <laughs> you you laugh, right? But that doesn't bother me because, like, the notion of four seasons is complete nonsense as well. Like, you know, like, like we don't live in a country with, well, I guess we have four seasons, kind of. But, like, say in Korea, uh, th- there were no four seasons, right? Like, that just yeah. wasn't a thing. And, like, ecologists, apparently, according to Wikipedia use six seasons to gauge the year like the idea of assigning an exact numerical value to the amount of seasons you have and just saying yeah. it is always like that is nonsense so the idea of them being all like we're going to make i think they may they have an this calendar crew have an autumn season and a fall season um they stick in next right year. i'm like gravy my, go for it who cares no one cares my amusement is is more based on the idea that like it, it actually requires some kind of astronomical engineering <laughs> to actually create a new set of physical requirements for there to be a fifth season <laughs> rather than they just you know divided the actual time differently i was imagining like we're going to reposition the earth for what would it be oh 80 days to to get this new set of set of thingies um but yeah no i mean obviously it's 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 a social construct and uh, i i yeah, divide it up however you want but <laughs> that wasn't what i was laughing at so the, uh, the, the it's like i said it's worth checking out the indiegogo just uh because this is like irl world building you know um yeah for sure so go check it out and see what you think and we might do i didn't get a chance to pour through all of it so i might do a bit of a follow-up on it uh, next time if they if people are interested um, but yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, final thing from the email. Apologies, everyone. This is very Edgar heavy. Um, is <sighs> we got a uh, email from a Sam Katz uh, who asked about uh, a Caribbean money and toroidal worlds. Uh, they they wanted to know whether or not they could send the Bank of Artifacts here some Cuban peso and some Trinidadian Trinidadian. Trinidadian. I think Dadian. Let me check. Trin- Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidadian. Could be. I don't know. Well, anyhow, uh, they wanted to know if they could send some Cuban peso and some dollars from Trinidad um, uh, to the Bank of Artifacts. Yeah, and the answer to that is yes. Please. That's class, particularly the Trinidad and, T- and Tobago dollars, because uh, like it's not unheard of for people uh, here to go to Cuba for a holiday, although it is quite costly. But like I don't know of anyone who has ever been to Trinidad and Tobago, so that's that's a far flung destination that uh, 
uh, people in my life are unlikely to go to. So yes, please, please, please send it in uh, with a nice with a nice letter to the uh, Bank of Artifacts. Yeah. Um, Sam goes on to say that uh, they've they've started looking I- into uh, toro- toroidal planets for their own world building, and they're wondering: Can I suggest more uh, resources? on on the topic beyond the video I made all those years ago and whether or not I am going to update said video uh, to be more kind of comprehensive. Um, and the answer to both of those things are no. Uh, for the simple fact that no one, I, I, no one writes about this. Like this is not a thing where you can go... Uh, you know, search on that, uh, that science site, the archive, A-R-X-I-V, whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't just search papers on donut worlds and see what science is saying about it. Like, this is not a thing that people study or do. Um, so everyone who has kind of made a donut planned video kind of all draw it from the same one source. And that's the source that I was using in, in that video. And beyond that, I just, I don't have a degree in, in, in physics to be able to comprehend what happens and certainly to the you know to the idea of like figuring out climate zones on a toroidal world it's just like that's beyond that is beyond my pay grade um to to do and beyond most people's pay grade because again it's a thing that's that's never really written about uh if someone does know of these things send them my way for sure if i can compile enough information then i'll look at doing another one uh but yeah when i looked there was just that that was it everything i could find was in that video Right. So yep. n- nothing new in the last few years. Nothing new in the last few years. Well, possibly, mm. but I-, I doubt it. Because, like, the question of saying, like, uh, you know, like, who goes? I'm going to figure out where one would put oceanic climate zones on a planet that's shaped like a donut. Like, no one does that, you know? Like, that's not a thing that people are dedicating their uh, intellectual energy to at all. Um, I mean, like, it's hard enough for me to try and find uh papers that deal with climate zones on terrestrial planets as in like you know a paper that says like what might the climate zones be on said exoplanet um that even doesn't exist now imagine a donut planet yeah it's not happening um unfortunately uh anyhow so uh then uh, should i crack on Yes. Uh, a fi- final thing on my end, and then I'll pass it over to Bill, is that uh, Drozen Keep from the last episode who made the really cool planet graphing calculator, uh, they have refined it uh, even further by using the exact equations in the paper I was working off for my video. Um, so they, you know, crunched all the very complicated numbers uh, going straight from the source. And yeah, it's a uh, version two of the calculator. It's better, bigger, better, faster, stronger. Uh, so go go check it out. Links in the description. And with that, that's that's me done talking. Bill's gonna talk about music and world building, folks. Let's all sit back and listen to his dulcet tones. <laughs> My rich caramel baritone. <laughs> um, so we got a comment on last episode on Reddit from Chiron One Five Six. Um, I'll just read out the the relevant part. Sure. What do you think of my idea for a world that has music, but it's very bland and only learned or taught through strict teachings? Then one generation of teens and 20-somethings start teaching themselves and inventing other genres of music, which create a clash between old and new music. Eventually, bards become a strong part of their culture. Uh, So my response to this, um, I thought it raised some interesting questions, uh, and the things to consider for it are... In what way is music suppressed? So you say that, you know, it's, it's follows strict rules, uh, or it's taught through strict teachings and it's very, very bland. Um, humans are creative and will, will lean towards expression and, and creation. And it will be interesting to, to figure out exactly through what processes is other kinds of creation prevented or punished or suppressed because you you can have a, a college of of dour music teachers who say that there's only one way to do things all you want, but you're still going to have people who sing at funerals, or people who get drunk and sing, or children who make up silly songs for themselves and things like that. And um, so this, I mean, there's definitely a, a, a situation like this is conceivable, but I think you'd have to 
uh, think about what is what are the social norms that cause it to be this way. Um, the other thing is that music conventions are always in flux, and what we think of as the rules of music in, in music theory, they're just kind of a description of what is done. Um, do you watch Twelve Tone, Edgar? I do. Um, Twelve Tone, they had a good video recently uh, about music theory and making the case that it is descriptive, not prescriptive, and that mm-hmm. a lot of people don't think of it that way. A lot of people think that these are rules that are meant to be followed, where it's actually their description of what people did. Mm. And you follow them if you want to imitate those people, but they are not like natural laws of physics. Um, yeah. And they're always in flux. They're always changing. Um, and anyway, the, the Chiron156 responded, um, uh, teachers gain their position for following rules and telling on those who don't. Uh, anyone who wants to perform profession and needs to be taught the traditional ways and are given permission to play uh, the approved music once they have succeeded in their, their training. Um, and then in that, that the people who, who enforce the rules are just gradually replaced. So it's changes slow. They, they get their status by adhering to the norm. And that is why change is so slow because they, they, to become part of the establishment, they have to accept the, the state of the establishment, I guess. Um, but they added, while writing the above, I now imagine there would be a musical black market of sorts. Underground bands will be criminals who might illegally own instruments or people who went through schooling so they can claim that they're actually professional performers. Uh, I could see there being speakeasies for music. Um, so that's, that's kind of a nice, a nice spin on it that there is a, uh, this formal strict version of things. And then there is this other type of expression that exists outside that. Um, because I think it would be very difficult to, to conceive of a world where any kind of musical expression was under some kind of centralized control or even in any, an individual society. Um, I did, Jesus, four years ago now, um, I, I wrote the first part of a thing about world building music, um, which was looking at the, the social aspects of, of music and how to conceive of those for world building. Um, you, you did it on the show for the show. I wrote it independently, but we did we did discuss it on the show. Oh, wow! I totally forgot about that. <laughs> um, it was one of the times where you said you really liked all the bits in italics, as you often do in my writing. Oh, nostalgia! God, that brings back memories. <laughs> Remember those italics, everyone? Um, they were great. <laughs> um, so one model of thinking about music for for world building from from a social point of view is that there are kind of three groups of people involved. Broadly speaking, you have the artist, you have the audience, and you have the mediator. Mm. So the artists are those who create the music in in whatever sense, be it the the performers or the composers, etc. The audience are those who receive the music. It's pretty self-explanatory. And then mediators can be kind of uh, any other any other role involving taking from the audience to the the artist or from the artist to the audience. So in Spotify. the kind of the modern Western world, uh, promoters or record labels or publishers, things like that. Okay. Um, so I, I, you can link this if you want. Um, and anyone who's interested in world building, go and have a read of this and... and consider those roles when when world building the the music within a society mm-hmm. who are the audience who are the artists and who are the mediators and i think who the mediators are is possibly the the, the most interesting one i was literally about to say 100 percent, especially given uh chiron's uh uh set up there like the mediators are kind of like society the establishment in a way uh, yeah, and that's that, that's really interesting to play with because, like, yeah, who the artist and who the uh, audience is is kind of obvious, you know. Um, whereas the mediators are non-obvious, and there's a lot, yeah. lot of scope for creativity there. Although, I mean, well, first of all, there could be overlap between them. That the in in Chiron's uh, description, the the artists are also the mediators because they control it. Um, sure. in, in, yeah. in a lot of ways, or they they have some control over the mediation of it. 
Um, you do get situations, you could argue, where the artist and the audience overlap. Um, like in really small music scenes where you just got like bands of like a certain genre in a small localized area where it's just people playing for people who are in bands. Like it's just bands playing for each other. Mm-hmm. Um, you get an overlap. Like that, that was, there's a, I think it was for the shoegaze scene in England in the nineties. It was known as the, the scene that watches itself because it was only shoegaze artists who went to shoegaze gigs. What what is a shoegaze? Shoegaze, it's um, kind of it's quite quite heavy uh, and kind of hypnotic, sort of mm. alt rock from the from the kind of late eighties, early nineties. Um, My bloody Valentine, I consider a shoegaze band. What's the? Oh, really? Oh, right. What what is um, what's the etymology of the word shoegaze? Um, because people would just like stand around and like look down at their shoes while they were listening to music. Like, it wasn't, like, really high-energy dancing. Um, possibly because Man. of heroin. I think heroin Poss- played a role in that. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> the, I would never have thought of... My bloody Valentine. That's like, they're, the, they're the, the Welsh lads. Are you thinking of Bullet for My Valentine? Bullet for... That's what I'm thinking of. I was like, <laughs> I, was like I remember listening to Bullet for My Valentine, and none of these... Everything you're saying here does not fit with what I remember Bullet for My Valentine being like. But yes, no, I don't know what My Bloody Valentine is at all. Yeah, um, I think I think they were largely Irish, My Bloody Valentine. Oh, really? Yeah, they're from, from, they're from Dublin, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, I didn't know that. So, so with, I'm just bringing that up as an example of an overlap between audience uh, and artists. That sure. shoegaze was kind of was seen as being one of something like that, that there, were, there was an overlap. They, they only played for each other. It was a small thing. Uh, can I chime in here a little bit? No. Okay. Uh, moving on. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> so uh, I, I would imagine, uh, just thinking off the cuff here, right? Uh, I yep. would imagine one way of making Chiron's uh, scenario work um, is just like giving music a uh, religious role. Um, yeah. Uh, and like in a, not in a sort of like, music has to be church music and anyone who doesn't play church music is like evil and banned but more like in a in a setting where like music is is very literally divine uh and mm-hmm. the idea of uh, you know children singing to themselves in a non-prescribed way the culture kind of uh sets that as being like you know the work of the devil and people are, would be afraid to do that and people would mm-hmm. like only want to conform to the to the exact divine way of doing things. And then, you know, people can rebel from that as society moves or whatever. And um, that might be one way of doing it. Um, because I can imagine stuff like, you know, the, the Catholic church, pres- like uh, historically the Catholic church have prescribed how music should be um, to musicians. Um, mm-hmm. And people uh, back in the time where the Catholic church had a, had a big hold over people or a much bigger hold than it does now, people would like, dogmatically follow that because they don't want to get in god's bad books um and then some pioneers were all like do you know what do you know what this interval the the tritone it's okay we can use dissonance it's fine we can do that there was a break away from it so it's not it's not i don't think it's it's crazy to just give make the music divine and then i think the idea of like prescriptivism to an extreme extent follows very naturally from that sure yeah um cool my my uh my little uh my little thought mouth mouth sayings work there it was good <laughs> <laughs> you english so well i english it so well uh tall lawn brer brer lag um okay um, so have you got anything else to say on that or should we move into a bit of world billing um you know if you give me a second here someone did say something about music on one of the I think on the first Atlas map video comments on the, on the Reddit. So I might oh. have a quick read of that and see if I can give it a quick response on air. I'll write oh. a comment to it as well, but go, yeah, go for it. Go for it. Um, I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep the air from being dead. I'm just going to, I'm going to talk to people. Hello. Sure. Artifacts. Yeah. I'm going to do some ASMR bill while you're away. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, I can do this. I can do this. Hold on. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, I, it even feels wrong to do lip smacking things. ASMR. 
Bill is reading comments. <laughs> Bill is reading music comments. Oh, so creepy. So creepy. <laughs> okay, I've got I've got one. Okay, you've got one. Go for it. Yeah. Um just not in in response to anything from the last episode, but on the comments on Reddit for the first Atlas map video. We have one mm-hmm. here from Lucas Sprain. Mm-hmm. Um, who's talking about, he, he asked you, would you do any music building in your, in your videos? And, um, he, he comments, uh, I don't even see how different music could be anyway. I oh, guess yeah, there could be yeah. different mathematical equations in different worlds that show what kind of harmonics or chord progressions are nice to different alien ears. But music theory would generally be the same, I think. There could be different instruments though. Uh, the, before before you answer that, right? I I think yeah. that that question is indicative of why I don't want to cover music because, like that, like there is so like music can be so different from what we have to the point where I I feel like I would need to become a to get dedicated music world building channel in order to like adequately cover all the different yeah. ways the physics of sound works, you know? And I think people, when they go like, will you do some music building? Uh, they think like, oh, that's a thing that, that you could do totally in like maybe three, four episodes. And I'm like, give me more like a hundred and maybe we yeah. could like begin to scratch the surface, you know? I mean, music building is honestly probably at least as deep as conlanging. Oh, ho- yeah, you know, 100%. You, could, you couldn't cover conlanging as a, as a whole in three or four episodes um, yeah, yeah, and I just want to say, like, this is in, in no way me like criticizing or slating or attacking Lucas. Um, no, no, not at all. Know, if, no, this is not 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 the the point of my of my response here at all. Um, but like, even the diversity of music that exists on Earth is is so vast that thinking the the comment here, what kinds of harmonics or chord progressions. Like that doesn't even cover all of human music. Mm. That th- those concepts aren't relevant. Like chord progressions is only relevant to music derived from Western music mm-hmm. in the last four hundred years. Yeah, there are so and many d- musics in the world where the concept of harmony is like incidental. Like it's not a thing that people think about. Like it occurs yeah. when sounds are made at the same time, but they don't yeah. care or think about it. There, there is. There is um, an argument that that some make that even in kind of Western common practice music, which f- for people who aren't into music, like broadly say classical music um, and kind of modern harmonies, um, that 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 the the concept of harmony that we have there is just an accidental thing that arises out of counterpoint, that arises out of different melodies. And we have kind of taken it as a thing in itself and run with it and built stuff mm. from that. But that naturally, harmony is kind of an, an artificial concept in a way that, that counterpoint isn't and that, that co- current melodies aren't. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you're, 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 you're onto, he's onto something here in that, you know, a different alien uh, physiognomy would... Our different alien physiology would potentially have different responses to to aural stimulus, absolutely, and mm. different instruments. That's something I think would be very interesting to to explore. But but even but even there, right? Like there was an episode of David Bruce composer recently, uh, or se- semi recently, where he looked at uh, music made by elements or made with. Oh elements. yeah, I saw that. So like in that video for people, I'll, I'll link it if I can find it. Uh, but TL Dior, he there's a bit in it where he looks at how people make music with water, and uh, as in like there was one particularly cool thing where people were standing in the sea and they were like performing a percussion work using the sea, uh, and like yeah. depending on how they slap the water in terms of like did they slap it with the with the flat of their hand or with the side of their hand or. Did they clap while their hands were semi-submerged? It creates different acoustics. So when people say, the reason why I bring this up is that when people say like, oh, there could be different instruments, I think people think in their heads it'd be like, there's going to be funky guitar looking things or like the instruments that are used in the Star Wars cantina, things like that. But like the scope of what is and isn't an instrument that can be used in music is just like insane. You know, like, mm. like the soil 
becomes an instrument real quick when you think about it. You know, like bark becomes an instrument. Uh, the body becomes a, a percussion kit as an instrument. And so, again, just on the concept of like, why don't you do music world building? Was because, yeah, I need like 50 videos to address what is and isn't an instrument. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but and again just I want to reiterate as well Bill what you were saying like there's no way uh, a, a slant against Lucas for bringing this up like not at all um, and I'm not saying like all you know Lucas is, is silly to say these things like n- like no way at all like all I'm doing is is, is uh, explaining the complexities behind that statement you know mm-hmm. um, so yeah I should probably get back to that at some stage and write another entry in I said there would be maybe three entries and I wrote that four years ago and haven't written a second one yet but the second one was really hard because it was going to be actually looking at theory and kind of the the physical fundamentals of sound but mm. maybe someday <laughs> someday with enough audience pressure nudge nudge wink wink <laughs> uh, another point as well about the the music world building um is that unlike conlang um it is a thing that is a little bit can be a little bit alienating to people um because like if you think about conlang is like uh, if i boil it down to its absolute sim- most simplistic state it's like making different noises for words right uh, and people can kind of get that you know like that's that's a easy thing like people can go look up elvish and learn a couple of lines of elvish and there's not a great kind of barrier to entry there um yeah. whereas with music if you aren't musically adept, which I, now given most people are to have some degree of musicality, but there are people who don't have musicality. Um, if you aren't adept at that, that's a completely opaque thing to you. And so to then to, for someone to come along and be all like, oh, I'm writing a novel and it's, it's I don't know, a, a key plot point is Pythagorean tuning, the, the way an alien species uses Pythagorean tuning or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. that's so opaque to people that it's like, I, I question, I question the necessity of delving that deep into it, you know? Um, so, cause I, I, I think people, again, when they say like do music world and they're looking for like mad funky out there musical scenarios and they are cool, but just really opaque to people, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, like even I, like I've talked to, like for example, uh, a relative's uh, partner. I've talked to this person who who is into music to a degree, but hasn't um, gone through it to the same level I have uh, in terms of studying in college and things like that. And even and, and they specifically like different genres than than I do. Um, even trying to communicate what I know about my genre, my studies, to a person who is just even in the same paradigm, like Western music, is really difficult, like super difficult. And then the notion of kind of like doing that same level of complexity and then conveying it to a lay audience is just like, it's such a Herculean task that I, yeah, this is another one of the reasons why I like music world building, not a thing I'm going to do. So uh, the the usual customary thing is that Bill does some world building and then I talk about whatever videos I've been making. But uh, I'm not going to fulfill my part of of that custom this month because the videos I've been making have been uh, Atlas mapping videos and I've been kind of addressing stuff uh, with regards to the video in the actual videos themselves. Um, So I would just be repeating myself here. So this, this writer's room, it would be dedicated entirely to the man, the myth, the legend, Bill McGrath. <laughs> Go for it. A Bill episode. <laughs> Bill episode. <laughs> um, okay, let's just get straight into it. Uh, we are once again in the world of Icarn. Oh, hang on, let's not get straight into it. I need to, I need to find the feckin' thing. Hold on. Uh, oh, <laughs> shit, it's gone. Oh, where'd it go? Oh, no. This is, this is pants. Hold on. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, Let's get straight into waiting for Edgar to find us. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I have... Let me get my hi- my trusty highlighter tool. All right, I have the pros in front of me. You may narrate when ready. Narration is go. Fellow workers, I cannot give you my name, but I am an ally to your cause. I labor in a printing works in the city, and we have been given an order to print a series of illustrations for posting all around the city. 
It is a series of four images to be printed in five colours, no expense spared, and it represents an attack on our movement and our safety. The images are as follows. The first in the series depicts a young man, a ground worker, leaving his home for a day of labour. He carries a hammer over his shoulder. In the background can be seen two towers, modelled upon the old tower and the grand tower, at a perspective impossible to achieve from any real location in the city. His clothes are in good repair, and he has the healthy complexion and expression of a young labourer in the prime of his health. He is crossing a street filled with groundsfolk of various professions attending to their own trades. The subsidiary characters of the series are visible. His parents stand at the door of their building attending to their own labour. A young man of similar age and appearance can be seen in the street wearing the uniform of a probationary officer of the Tamar Company. In the second image of the series, the young man is leaving a workshop at the end of the day, carrying his hammer low by his side. He is stepping into an alley where several dark figures are huddled conspiratorially, one of whom is beckoning the young man to join them. These figures are dressed in ragged labourer's clothes, apart from one who is in the garb of an Earthani mate. In the third image, the young protagonist stands atop a cart, brandishing a sheaf of agitator's literature and addressing a crowd comprising enthusiastic fellow agitators, the conspirators from the last image, and shocked citizens. His face is twisted by anger and blotched with drunkenness, and his clothes have become stained and torn. His hammer lies broken upon the ground by the wheels of the cart, alongside discarded bottles of earthani spirits. At the left side of the image, the young company officer watches stoically, while the labourer's parents observe from the right margin their faces a study of shame and despair. In the fourth and final illustration, the young man, his clothes in tatters, lies mortally wounded under a militiaman brandishing a club. On the same street as the first illustration, a detachment of militia is engaging a gang of agitators. The honest workers can no longer be seen, and their smashed tools lie in the agitator's wake. The constables are being directed by the young officer, now in the uniform of a second lieutenant. The labourer's parents watch weeping, while the conspirators can be seen escaping down a side alley, unnoticed by the constables. A more naked, unsubtle piece of propaganda I have never seen. If you can publish a mockery or a reply to this laughable series before the series itself is printed, it shall lose all currency in the public view. Please do so with greatest haste. There are but a few days before this shall be distributed through the city. Signed, An Ally. Cool. It's very different from what you've had before. Yeah? Very different. Yeah, I like it. Hmm, um, cool. All right, uh, talk to me. Give us the background info before we launch into questions. Um, what real-world event occurred that made you want to write about this? <laughs> uh, nothing occurred recently, but um, I, I was again. I was really kind of struggling with it the last few days, um, and I wanted to. I wanted to stay in Cairn and stay connected to something that I'd done before. I had a few kind of new ideas, but I didn't want to do something totally new. Um, I wanted to to be something that we like was relevant to older writings, um, and I was kind of thinking of how I could delve a little bit into the the idea of the the visual culture of the world, like the 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 art culture of the world, mm-hmm. um, without actually producing the art, um, and. Th- I, I guess just this was it, a description of a piece of uh, visual propaganda from Lansk. Um, and I guess in, in the last couple of weeks, I've been, I, I was looking at a bit of James Gilray, who was a political cartoonist from the late 17, early 1800s. Um, I suspect if you looked at his, his work, you'd, you'd see something you're familiar with. He's, he's quite well known. Um, did you ever see the the cartoon of people getting uh, smallpox vaccination, uh, where like they're they're erupting with like cows? 
Uh, no, but I am Google image searching his work, and yeah, no, this, this sort of genre of uh, of cartoon I've seen before. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure some of his ones are, are the ones you've seen before because he he was quite prolific and quite well known. Um, do, uh, do, he, he he's quite an interesting figure, both like historically and just visually. I, I like his style. Um, do you foresee? If I may jump in here, do you foresee? Oh, sorry, I got to sneeze again. It's the coronavirus, man. <laughs> uh, do you for do you foresee uh, these pamphlets, these flyers in Lansk, uh, looking like Jim uh, James Gilroy's work, like in aesthetic? Uh, not really. Maybe in the choice of color, um, because it would be p- p- possibly a sort of a similar uh, infrastructure and availability of of color. Um, uh, when you, for mass production. When you said uh, up here, we were like a series of four images to be printed in five colors. Um, yeah. The idea of like a kind of a limited color palette um, made me think of kind of like Third Reich propaganda. Now, I know most of it was kind of like, or at least the kind of graphic stuff that I'm thinking of is, you know, red, white and black. Um, okay. But I just, I thought of that uh, with a few extra colors. I was thinking very kind of almost stylized um yeah that's sort of you know you know it's sort of like that that graphic this is a dictatorship sort of flyer that sort of stereotypical thing that's what i was thinking of when you were reading this interesting mm. um what i what i was thinking of when i had to be printed in five colors uh i, I was thinking of uh, colored illustrations in old books like early 20th century late late uh, 19th century books that they would have wood prints um, and the way they would have to do that is they would, like a page would be printed with the red ink and then the, the yellow ink would be printed on top of that. So if it was slightly off, you would get weird overlaps or, or weird disjoins between the, the fields of color. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that was kind of what I was thinking from, from a technological point of view and a little bit from an aesthetic point of view there. When I was conceiving of this overall, um, I, I was thinking of, well, actually, we'll, we'll get into we'll get into kind of my my overall artistic idea of it in in a bit. Um, f- further down. Uh, before before we move on, though, uh, just just mm-hmm. in case, in the off chance, if someone is uh, into an art project and wants to uh, g- give us their take on these flyers, can you point out maybe what five colors you are thinking of? Um, because it's unusual five. Like you think the primary colors here. Um, five is a bit of a weird weird uh, thing I, I guess maybe are you counting black and white as a color uh i had not really no mm-hmm. um yeah i mean I, I that's the kind of thing that will be dependent on what dyes are available won't it um, i i think it should be cyan turquoise uh mauve teal <laughs> teal <laughs> And ultramarine, and ultramarine, all like all like really wishy washy pastel <laughs> colors. Avoid all the inks you actually have in your printing shop, like the red, the green, the blue. <laughs> Just go for all the trippy, like secondary colors. <laughs> um, yeah, I hadn't really thought of which which specific uh, five colors they would be. Okay, um, it would depend, I guess, on what what. Uh, was it available to make inks and dyes with in in Lansk, and I haven't uh, decided that. <laughs> sure. Um, but I guess red, yellow, green, blue, something else. Yeah, and then b- black and white notwithstanding. I'm assuming, you know, black and white. Yeah, I, yeah. I guess not. Yeah, um, because everyone knows they're not colours. Um, that drives people absolutely daft. Um, when, pe- when people go black and white isn't a colour. Um I came up in a in a design meeting one time I attended uh, where there was a confrontation with designers over whether or not they should treat black in their logo as being a color or not. Uh, and I was kind of like, what? What pedantic nonsense like? It's black. Like, who cares? Like, who cares, right? Like, use the thing if you want to or not. Like, who cares what we call it? But there was a big kind of like, no, no, like we need like a, I don't know, like a two color logo and, you know, whether or not black is a color is going to influence that. I'm just like, Jesus, lads, what are you doing? Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, anyway. That sounds like, that sounds like an annoying debate. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of what I was thinking from, from uh, what, what got me thinking about this. And um, 
anyone who is into their art history. Uh, actually, I should get the name of this guy before I finish this next bit. Um, Google's furiously. Might, yeah, might um, be thinking of a series of paintings called A Rake's Progress by uh, an artist called William Hogarth, uh, which is, I guess, b- broadly similar in, in purpose to what I'm doing here. It was kind of a, a moral tale about uh, a, a rich young man who kind of descends into debauchery uh, from drinking too much gin, and he ends up in the madhouse or dying or something. Um, and it's, it's like a series of vignettes of him starting out as, uh, you know, in education or in a, in a career or something, and then just becoming more and more depraved as as things go on and falling into criminality and vice and gin. I love how gin was a big problem back in the day. Like it was like a heroin level problem. And now yeah. gin, gin is like this cool thing that little craft breweries make. Uh, <laughs> I think that that's absolutely hilarious how the culture around gin has completely shifted. It's brilliant. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming here, uh, in your your version, the Lansk version of the Rake's Progress here is this idea of like the good the good citizen who is going to become a Tamar Company person gets corrupted by those those evil Earthani people and others, and this is the this is where that story that corruption ultimately leaves leads. Here's a bunch of pictures depicting the downfall. Uh, more or less, yeah. Now, the, the, the labourer, the, the protagonist uh, being described here wouldn't be going for a, a company career. He's just kind of a, a labourer. Um, the, a company career is, is a little bit more uh, middle class than, than this character. Oh, right. Okay. Um, okay. Um, but like, he, he, he is a, a happy worker, um, who is part of society and he gets brought into, um, agitation by these conspirators and it ends in his death but they escape now come here uh, i'm jumping all over the place i'm sorry I, I haven't even let you finish your summary but like you know this this is such as the nature of my mind uh, <laughs> the is there an any element of truth to these flyers um has there been any event where the athani athani have disrupted society for better or for worse or is this just complete made up uh xenophobic propaganda M- much i would lean much more towards the latter interpretation like there are there are definitely in the history of all interactions things where the Urthani have attempted to subvert norms within the the Abesk society and you know like, yeah sure they they sell spirits um, which are disproved by, um, are disapproved of by, uh, some of the, the Abesque and their, their concepts of how society should be run are not fully compatible. Um, but it is not in any way like a, a deliberate conspiracy on, on behalf of the Earthani in general to mm. get happy young laborers murdered by the constables. Okay. All right, so yeah, it's just it's just outright fear mongering. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, keep going with your summary. <laughs> um, well, that, that that's pretty much it. So it's it's it was inspired kind of because uh, I've been thinking about uh, political cartooning in that sort of eighteen hundreds, early eighteen hundreds era, and I I saw a p- kind of a potential parallel with Reich's progress, um, and condensed it down into four images used as a piece of propaganda by uh, a sort of establishment within Lansk to uh, push back against the labour agitation that I described in two previous... Remember the riot? And yes. The, and the, the, yeah. So it's kind of... It's in, in response to that kind of movement. This, this is set slightly after that period, like, you know, a few months later. Oh, uh, okay, okay. And and uh, you say in the opening part here about, like, it's it's made in the printing works and the illustrations are for posting all around the city. Um, yeah. Define more. Are we talking, are you using posting in the sense of, like, in newspaper type things or for, like, sticking on you know, street signs or whatever? Are, they, are these posters? Are these part of a publication? What's, what's the story there? Um. So do you remember when I, I talked about the, the broadsheet before? Um, and it was no. it was not exactly like yes. a. I do, I do, yeah. I do, yeah. So the the increasing danger of of the northern settlements. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's a similar kind of thing to that, that it's, it is a kind of like a poster, so it will be put up on walls, and, and also, so it's it's four separate kind of large pamphlets, um, maybe like the size of the, the front page of a broadsheet newspaper. Um, okay. And they will be, like, put around, or they can be purchased from, from vendors, um, as well as being posted on, like, notices and things. Um, is is the printing works what what is the connection the printing works has to the establishment like are they a wing of the state or are this are they just um a, a, a private company that's ideologically anti earthani um what's the like What's the connection of any media or any media company to the state? It's kind of like th- those things are are um, are fluid. Um, I would say I would imagine that the printing works in question is uh, owned by someone who is heavily invested in the status quo. Yeah, so okay. either someone who who is or it's it's a subsidiary of one of the companies, perhaps, or it's it's owned by a a wealthy licensed prospector who is opposed to the the kind of extension of labor rights that are being agitated for right okay okay so this is this, so this isn't like a, a, a like a radical left or radical right right wing independent publishing house this is more no. more to do with the the state more on that end um, of the spectrum yeah like it wouldn't be owned by the authorities as such but it would be allied with them ideologically sure, sure. um cool very cool um the uh oh you mentioned down here um these figures are dressed in ragged labor's clothes apart from one who is dressed in the garb of an earthani mate um mm-hmm. uh describe briefly and how does the garb of an earthani mate differ from that of a tamar company person uh so tamar company would be a kind of a militaristic um uniform like it, it is a it is a a military uniform. Would they look? Would they look like how uh, Napoleon looks? And I mean that seriously. I'm not just bringing up Napoleon for the meme. <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't fully, I haven't fully worked that out in my mind yet. But let's say yes for the moment. Okay, like that. That sort of era of military guard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A- and so, would the Arthurian stuff be like similar, except different colors, or are we talking a whole different aesthetic? No, oh, it would be. It would be quite a different aesthetic. Mm. Um, any sort of rough real world analog so I can get some visual imagery here um, I haven't exactly decided um, for some reason I'm thinking that they would have like scarves would be would be um, used among among the the Arthani or scarves some, like some kind of neckwear yes neckwear um, okay okay yeah, I, I don't know why exactly but that, that that's occurring to me and then like they, their jackets would be of very different cuts things like that because remember, the Arthani are are they, they they work on on the river, so they like they their their clothing needs would be significantly different to airmen. Oh, hang on now, hold on, sir. The so what was the clothing used by naval officers in and around Napoleon's time? Did that differ from what I think of the stereotypical kind of Napoleon garb? No, not not particularly. Okay, okay. So it's it, so it's it's different from the real world in that sort of sense. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Like, I mean, they they would have had slightly different cuts, and they would have had different colors and things. But I think to to us, they would look broadly similar. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I kind of wish you were an artist, man. I'd love some pictures. Uh, maybe you are an Me artist. Too. Actually, I don't know. Can you draw? I mean, anyone can draw. <laughs> uh, can, okay, let me rephrase. Can you accurately depict on paper what is in your head? when you see a Tamar company person? Um, no, but... So, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a good visual artist. Like, I can't draw well. Um, but also, I don't have very strong visual images. Oh, yeah, we talked about that. We talked about that last yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it's a shame. It's a shame. Uh, the, the next bits here, uh, just to point out a nice little turn of phrase you got here, which I think is really cool. Blotched with drunkenness. Mm-hmm. I like that. Um, do you know? It reminded me of another little phrase I read in the book that we're going to review next month. Uh, roped with muscle. Love that phrase. <laughs> Hardworking man, roped with muscle. 
brilliant phrase. Um, you should read some some uh, Robert E. Howard. Do, do I have to? <laughs> I joke. Because um, he, he's the guy who, who wrote Conan. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and he wrote uh, a lot of boxing stories as well, which I quite enjoy. Um, but he's the only author I can think of, apart from one other who I read recently who was explicitly doing a kind of Conan pastiche, who has ever word- used the word fuse. Fuse? Fuse. T-H-E-W-S. T-H-E-W... What the hell is that? It's like sinew. So, so oh. Conan has like massive muscles and bulging thews or like iron muscles and steel sinews is kind of what, what he's getting at. That it, his strength is both in his muscles and his sinew. That's, um, that's an interesting Robert E. Howard is really into sinew for whatever reason. He's really, <laughs> he's a man who like, he's a sinew a connoisseur. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know if I'm saying the word sinew right. Hold on. No, I think sinew. you are. Sinew sounds right. Yeah, I was. Class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, that's not right. Um, the uh, only other thing I have uh, noted here is the Arthani spirits. Uh, yeah. Get, talk to me a little bit more about this. Like, are we... What, uh, moonshine? Uh, is this kind of like homebrewed liquor? Uh, what sort of plant is this coming from? Uh, um, or, or is this more like an ale type thing? Uh, no, it is It is more spirit kind of thing. I'm, I'm deliberately invoking kind of gin panic there. Okay. So you're, yeah. you're you're looking at a sort of gin. What is gin made from? Uh, Do you know juniper or something? Oh, fancy! I think. Let me check. <laughs> I'm reminded of uh, uh, Life of Brian <laughs> with the word every time. Ferment, I hear the word fermented juniper. grains, yeah. D- d- fermented grains with juniper berries, yeah. So are you thinking? You're thinking the same thing here. Some sort of juniper-like sort of thing, clear white spirit, that sort of jazz. Uh, a, a clear, clear spirit. Not necessarily juniper, but yeah, some something in the in the vodka gin kind of line. Are uh, we that is brewed aboard the ship or uh, distilled aboard uh, aboard the ship in small amounts? Are we looking at uh, an extremely high alcohol content here? Like, is this stuff rough, or is this has its reputation? Is his reputation somewhat unwarranted? Um, it it can be rough. It is not necessarily rough. Um. Like because it is, it isn't really mass produced as much. It is, it is kind of done in in small batches. It's it's artisanal. <laughs> it's artisanal. <laughs> artisanal spirits. Um, are, are you using artisanal in a sort of like moonshine sort of sense? Like, do, do, are were, were moonshiners artisanal craftsmen in your mind? Uh, I had never considered it, but I suppose they were. Okay. <laughs> But it's not it's not as illicit as as we would imagine when we're thinking of moonshine because it is just like a thing that that the Earthani do like it, a lot of craft will will brew their own spirits right okay and yeah it was, I, it's not illegal amongst the Earthani yeah it's not it's not even illegal as such in in Lansk or among the among the Abesk. it's just like it's they they don't have a, a law concerning it right but it's frowned upon like because of xenophobia. Uh, yeah, xenophobia and then moral panic over, over yeah. it, even though they they're big brandy fans. They, they they but you know they they see it as different. Oh, they like brandy. Yeah, they like brandy. Oh, very interesting. How would one consume uh, an Arthani spirit? Uh, again, is it like gin? Just like do, do or do 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 do? You, is there extra accoutrements that one might want, like a little olive in your Arthani spirit, or are you just kind of just like? <laughs> <laughs> or, or just put it in like a you know a, a, a bent copper pot and just shove it down your uh, food hole. Um, I'm sure that they have lots of different ways of preparing it and mixing it and things. In this portrayal of it, it is, yeah, it is drunk neat. Okay, that is a much more elegant way of putting it. Uh, man, do you know what we need? Do you know what I would like? I would like a uh, a write up on the crafting method of an Earthani spirit and the, <laughs> the, the 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 drinking culture surrounding Earthani spirits, particularly stuff like you know the way like um like I say we're doing tequila shots. You know the whole idea about you you pour the salt on your on your finger and you lick the salt and then you drink the thing like those and then, little- then you bite the lemon. And then you'd be exactly, you bite the lemon. Those are like cultural little kind of rituals surrounding drinking culture. Always very interesting. I think you should try and look into that. (laughs) Uh, It would make me happy. But anyway, that is all I have to say about your work. Is there anything, any final comments that you have? Um, Yes. Uh, 
I was I was trying to th- like kind of think more about the like literally how it would look on the page as as well as the colors, um, and I was thinking of kind of and I don't know why this came to my to mind, uh, maybe just to make it a bit alien from the 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 other eras and the other, the other kind of visuals that are implied, um, with the, with the rest of what I've written about Ikern. Um, I was thinking of kind of like a twentieth century sort of kind of almost like is it was it constructionism is is a Soviet art movement? I'm gonna Google this real quick. Oh, me too. Uh... Something like that, or constructivism. So I guess yeah, what, what you're saying about the about the the Nazi propaganda, the the red, black, and white. There's there's not a mi- a million miles between that and some of the the images of constructivism. Um, okay. So I thought it was going to be interesting. Now I might be I might be thinking of the wrong thing. Like suprematism, not suprematism is, is a bit more abstract. Um, but kind of bold colors and not not attempting to be very literally representational. Um, is kind of the the extant visual style in um. In Landscarts. Um, and w- this is what I say here about uh, the, the view of the old tower and the grand tower is that a perspective impossible to achieve from any real location in the city. So it's, it's more explicitly symbolic. It's that stylized. These have been chosen. Yeah, the, these have been chosen for stylistic reasons. And it's not meant to be this is an actual view from an actual location within the city. Um, and the, the kind of the counterculture pushing against that is a little bit more realist. And so there's oh, a kind of okay. an implicit there's an implicit criticism there that the the counterculture wants to portray things as they they really are, um, and that's that's not me making any kind of commentary about symbolism versus realism in real world art. I just thought that would be an interesting dynamic to have yeah. here in in this 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 world building. Uh, I am sending you some of what I think of as being like the you know Nazi flyer TM uh, thing on Skype. Have a look at that. Is that uh, I. Are you looking at that level of, of stylization? Oh, hold on a second, I just got a message. Yeah, that's from me. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah, I, I know. Kind of like that. Uh, links in the show notes um, to the propaganda posters but, there. Um, but like, That's cool, man. That's really cool. More. Well, yeah, this, this is more surely Soviet, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I googled Nazi flyer and that Brought, didn't bring up what I was thinking about uh, at all. So yeah, I was thinking more of Soviet stuff. Um, yeah, uh, that is the um, more aesthetic. I, I don't know. I just associate black, white, right, and red, red with Nazis for you know obvious reasons. Yeah, or I mean, or laundry companies in early twentieth century Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward. Um, no, that's cool. That's cool, man. Yeah. So I mean, not looking exactly like that, but it's kind of thing things like that. That it was it was a little less directly representational and a bit more symbolic and that the colours were kind of used for um, symbolic reasons rather than trying to portray an actual sky or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Cool, very cool. So, uh, folks, uh, I I want to continue in the theme of this this episode being like Irish heavy. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the election and by that, I don't mean the U.S. election. I mean the Irish election, because there are other elections mm-hmm. going on in the world. Um, <laughs> and I want to bring this up uh, because it's it's the way things have played out. It's a, been a very interesting election cycle here. And <sighs> it, <laughs> coronavirus. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and it's kind of left us with like a somewhat of an interesting puzzle to try and solve as in like given the results of the election how does one form a government and i've been running this sort of like puzzle by people um who aren't irish and it the conversation has always been good crack and they've really liked trying to like as an outside observer solve our parliament basically uh, and i thought it might be a fun idea to bring this to to artifacts yeah, and everyone can have a go at this um, as always with these things, this is going to talk about politics, but let's let's all try and be pretty neutral about this. Um, uh, try and think of this as like the abstract of like solving the problems of a system in terms of numbers, etc. Et let's not get into an ideological flame war about things because those things never end well at all. Let's be cold, let's be clinical, and let's just have some crack. Are you up for that, Bill? 
I will do my best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we just had elections. Uh, go to the show notes and or open up your podcast player. The, the An image of the results of the elections will be staring you in the face. You're going to need to see this image, otherwise you're not going to follow any of this crack. Uh, from the image, I'm going to start from left to right and I'm going to go through the various parties here and I'm going to give you their rough ideology. And the goal of this experiment is for you, dear Artifexia, to try and create an 81-seat coalition government that is happy to exist together and that would function, right? So, like, there's no point having a right, half of the coalition being, like, say, far right and half of the coalition being far left. Like, that just wouldn't function. Um, So can you solve it, Artifexia? Because so far, the Irish government, the Irish parliament, cannot solve it. So here we go. Fe- I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say from, from here on out, we're gonna call the parliament the doll. That, that is what we, we normally call it. And um, for other, other terminology, the, the leader of the doll is called the Taoiseach. That's like a prime minister role. Mm-hmm. And the, the deputy to that is called the Tanishta. Sure. And members of parliament are called TDs. Chalk the doll. Chalk the doll. Members of the doll. Um, sure, I was going for more generic terms, but you know what? Screw it. We have our own nomenclature. Let's do it. Um, Let's use it. Do we have a word for government? Like, uh, and, and Yes, but is or the... Re- Realtus? Now, when, so when they formed the 81C majority, what's the Irish word we used to describe that? Like, as in we would call it the government in, in English. Yeah, do we do we just call it the government in Irish? Or does it have a own no, name? No, I think, I think Realtus. Realtus, yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, the Regierung. <laughs> uh, but so anyway, anyway, here we go. So uh, starting from the left of the spectrum of this breakdown of votes. Um, <laughs> yeah. No comment. Carry no on. Comment. <laughs> the left of this uh, picture here, the first party here that won 38 seats out of the 160 seats is Fianna Fáil, FF. And ideologically, uh, Wikipedia says, because I'm going to try and not use my own biases, use what Wikipedia says, uh, says they are like a centre to centre right party. And they are part of the sort of establishment. Ever since the the uh, establishment of uh, our, the modern nation of Ireland, government has always involved this party or the next party on the spectrum. They're the two big parties. So they are they are mm. deep, deep uh, state. On. The, the, the next, the next one on on, on the spectrum is Sinn Fein. Uh, my bad, sorry, sorry. The third one, the third one over. We'll Take get, that again, yeah. We'll get them in a second. Um, so yeah, Fianna Fáil, centre to centre right, have been on and off in power for the guts of a hundred years. Thirty eight out of one hundred sixty seats, and remember, we want to make eighty one seats here. Sinn Fein, the next block over, won thirty seven out of the hundred sixty seats, so one less than Fianna Fáil. This party, now this is where things get really tricky in this election cycle. This party is kind of, has just in this election become a third party, like has become a a big party. It's always been a minor party, but now it's just exploded in this election cycle. It is a sort of left-wing party uh, that has a, a strong nationalistic bent to it. And there are people uh, who think that because Sinn Féin was the political wing of the IRA, which is which in its later incarnations was a terrorist group, there are people that worry uh, that th- this party is being run behind the scenes by legitimate actual terrorists, or ex-terrorists rather, because they're not really conducting any military activity now. Uh, so there is... This is a party that has kind of come in to the to the to the to the, the array uh, array come into the the ball game and kind of throw in a massive spanner amongst the work. So a left leaning party with potential connections to extremely suspect people getting thirty seven percent thirty seven seats out of one hundred and sixty. Then we have Fina Gaul, Fina, Fina Gael, uh, another establishment party. Uh, 35 seats of the 160, centre to centre right, is utterly indistinguishable from Fianna Fáil, the first party. <laughs> uh, the only reason they're different is because they were different sides of a political split during the establishment of the country. 
So so historically, they've been, that's why they're different, but like ideologically, they're exact same. I don't think that's uh, controversial at all, Bill, is it? I mean, there are specific things, very, very small things you can you can pick out um, that they have different bases. Uh, the Fine Gael is, I think, seen as a bit more, um, a bit more urban, and Fine Foil is seen as a bit more rural. Sure. Um, sure. And Fine Foil has historically been uh, slightly more successful than Fine Gael. But in <clears> terms of their current ideologies, yes, they are both centre-right neoliberal parties. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, so th- these are the three big players, right? So we should address the, their machinations here. Fianna Fáil don't want to work with Fianna Gael, per se, because of that old civil war split. In the ideal world, they will not want to form a coalition together. Neither party, both Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, want to really talk to Sinn Féin because they think they're terrorists. So the three kind of don't want to play together, which makes this, which makes the forming of the government in this election cycle so difficult. And this is the nature of this puzzle. Like, how do you solve it when you have such uh, different things? And also, Fianna, uh, Sinn Féin don't particularly want to work with Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael because they are establishment. Exactly, because Sinn Féin are, proposing, are, are presenting themselves as being real change. And in many ways, that is true. If you had a country that for its entire history, modern history, has been under the power of these two parties, like, uh, definitionally, a third party coming in represents change. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are the three, and those are the complications with those three. After that, we have I.O., which is independence and others. Um, these are problematic because uh, they're not affiliated with any party, so their ideological leanings can be all across the board. I haven't mm-hmm. looked into the exact breakdown here, but let's assume for the sake of this puzzle that they fall on a bell curve, and the the sort of the peak of the bell is in and around the center area. You're going to get some... I'd imagine there's like maybe one or two right, really right-leaning people in there, one or two extreme leftists, but most of them will be kind of like appeal to the majority sort of people. I think that's a f- safe assumption to make for the sake of this puzzle, Bill, yeah? Uh, yeah, that's for the sake, yeah. And the, the complicating matter with these people in terms of forming a government is that historically they've also kind of, like there's been, there was a period of Irish history where the government was kind of held to ransom by independence. Um, the kind of renegade people without any party affili- affiliation that kind of brought government to a standstill. Um, so people, I think, are... So, I'd imagine the politicians are somewhat weary about getting too cosy up to the independence because there's a... there's a That's a variable there that they can't control. So it's problematic there as well. Um, mm-hmm. After that, we have uh, the Green Party. Obvious, you know, environmentalists... Uh, left leaning, they. Mm. Uh, do you know what their uh, alignment is? Who they're willing to work with? Um, I think they said that they would be willing to work with anyone. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. Broadly speaking, they are uh, left wing, but they're they're not in every respect, and they were previously in coalition with Fianna Fáil. And that did a not of, a end of, well for them. For for them at all. No, I, I actually thought that they stopped existing. I think I think they might not have run any candidates in the following election after that government. <laughs> yeah, what what basically happened here, folks, is that they they ran on you know the promise of like wonderful change, and they they were in the government that it was either the government that oversaw the financial crash or the government directly after had to deal with it, and as such. Uh, the green agenda just got dropped. Like the majority party in that coalition was like, we don't care what you have to say about anything. All of mm-hmm. the things that you promise are just not happening. We're doing financial recovery now. And they got crucified at the polls next time around, at the at the ballot boxes next time around. Um, so that's the green party, left-leaning, left-ish leaning. Nominally. Nominally left, exactly. Uh, Labour is, according to Wikipedia, is kind of a centre-left organisation. Um small party uh they have very a very bad reputation with the people because again they're another one of those small parties that promised the world got into a coalition government and delivered nothing like uh, backtracked on everything um so there is a hesitancy i feel to want to include uh, labor for the bad pr that might occur there yeah, they they've done very badly this time around 
they've done very badly. Uh, Social Democrats, that's obvious. They're a left-leaning party. Um, They want social democracy. Um, Problems there, obviously, is that they probably don't ever want to play with any of the centre-right parties because it's ideologically not aligned. And the final one is Solidarity, People Against Profit. They are... Uh, I think safe to say the most people, left people before group. profit. Hold on a second. Wait, what? What? What did I say? People against profit. They're not opposed to profit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Like, no, no profit. No profit for anyone. Um, Sorry. Uh, so no, yeah, it's just solidarity. people are more important than what? profit. <laughs> yeah, solidarity people before profit i'm sorry uh, yeah. they are it's safe to say that they are the most extreme i don't even know if extreme is the correct word but the, the, the most left leaning of the sort of um parties they're not even it's not even the part they're like a loose alliance of of real leftists uh yeah, they're 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 two groups people before profit is uh i i think functionally part of the socialist workers party um and I'm not sure where Solidarity's roots are. Hold on, let me just check that. Solidarity. Uh, and so while Bill is checking profit. that, so again, the obvious problems here is that they're not, they are definitely not going to want into a, uh, want to jump into a, a right-leaning coalition because that's massively ideologically uh, uh, misplaced. So the idea here, folks, is can you create an 81-seat government uh, because there's 160, you need a majority, so you need 81. Can you create an 81 seat government that is ideologically consistent and that does not screw the will of the people? You know, like it's no good being all like, uh, let's say for argument's sake, it was like, let's group all the small people together to get to 81. That might work, but you're also, uh, you're dismissing the fact that people voted in droves for the big parties. So mm-hmm. can you balance the books here and can you come up with a result? Because again, the Irish government, the 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 doll has not been able to do this. Um, um, I'm going to issue a slight correction. Oh, go to, for it. To, to what you said there. Um, so the the largest party or the, the party with the largest chair is Fianna Fáil, mm-hmm. um, with 38 seats. They did not win 38 seats. They won 37, and the 38th seat uh, belongs to the Can Coyle. Who is like the like the speaker of the house in in Westminster? Um, it's it's a sure. a, a role to 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 keep order within within proceedings. Um, uh, so that's that that is a role that is automatically reelected and and the formation of a new doll. Oh, interesting. So it's a dead heat between Fianna Fáil and Sinn Fein in terms of the actual um. Seats in, in terms of the actual no, in the actual seats won. Yeah, seats won. Yeah, Fianna yeah, yeah. Fáil do have one more seat, um, but they 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 won the same number in the actual election. Hmm. Yeah. That's, um. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Yeah. It's it's a it's a tricksy one. It's a tricksy one, and I I don't see I don't see a, a solution forthcoming. I think there may be another election. So here's what my prediction is. Uh, I don't. Uh, I didn't want to give predictions because it might influence people's uh, fun and games with the puzzle, but uh, it's interesting. I, hold on. I, okay, I, hold on. I've got an idea. Go on. Tell us your prediction, and then like backtrack it in the in the thing, so people can like go and find out if they want to. They can just like play it backwards, or they cannot if they don't want to. What are you talking about? Play it backwards. Like, so you sit, tell me now, right? And then put it backwards on the podcast. And then if anyone wants to, they can download it and, and like, play it backwards. And <laughs> oh, you, see. Want, you want me to literally reverse what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> cool, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> my, pre- my prediction is that I think you're right. I think they will not be able to form a government. Um, no, uh, the back up, sorry. I think the, the correct answer, although it's not going to appease everyone, is that it should be Fianna Fáil plus Fianna Gael plus some other party that will make up the numbers. Uh, that's the most ideologically consistent one. It's a bit of a kick in the teeth to all the people who did vote left. Like there was a bit of a, a left uprising. But in terms mm-hmm. of like, just if you look at it, a clinical sort of like, can we make something work? I think that's the thing that would work. Um, 
but I don't think they're going to do that. I think we're going to go back for another election. And I think what's going to happen then is that's going to aggravate people to no end. And I think the left vote for Sinn Féin will uh, increase by a lot. And I could see the uh, Sinn Féin becoming a dominant, the dominant party then. And then I think mm-hmm. that changes the calculus of something serious because then I think you may even get a situation where there's enough to form a complete left uh, government, which would be the first yeah. time in Irish history, which would be nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we'll be uh, ruled by terrorists. What's the word to be ruled by terrorists? Is that is there a word for that? Jesus Christ. Uh, not one I'm aware of. Uh, I'm being I'm being facetious here because again that's the sort of the slander that people say that like yeah. they are ruled by terrorists like I mean um, like our current government is the organization that literally sent uh, a brigade to aid Franco in the Spanish Civil War so yeah let you know. let let he who is out sin cast the first stone <laughs> yeah yeah um so yeah solve the puzzle for us uh, artifacts yet yeah. see what 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 you think um cuz yeah like we said the uh are we, are uh, we back uh, in, in like going forwards now? We're not backwards anymore. Man, I don't even know if we're going to do the backwards thing. I don't even know how to do the backwards thing. I'm going to have to learn how to do this for this recording. <laughs> it shouldn't be that hard. No, it should be all right. It should be all right. Uh, we are back in, in recording now. Um, I, I, I have a closing question uh, to put to you, Bill, if that's okay. You can put it to me. Um, you know the way it is. it is uh, it is usual for left the left side of the political spectrum to be highly fractured in a way that the right side is not yes right and there it is argued i've heard people argue a lot that a lot of the reason why the left seems to do uh poorly in instances is because of that fracturing uh, fracturing Mm -hmm. because they can't just all get together and form one united force that can win majority votes they're always more into we need to create six different parties with slightly different ideologies. Do do you think that's a thing? And do you think that has uh, been a problem in Ireland, that like left-leaning people don't have the one party to go to uh, and we our votes are, uh, the votes of left-leaning people are always kind of like nullified because of this fracturing? I think there is an element of truth to that um to that idea that the 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 like the the first thing on the agenda is the split I think was an old an old joke about um like Sinn Fein or something from mm. from the 20s like or, I'm sure it's been used in lots of contexts um and yeah that there there are ideological differences I I don't think there are necessarily fewer ideological differences on the right um but I think maybe there's a sort of and this is in no way a a, a promotion of that but um there's a sort of a, a a different clarity of purpose that you can push against a common enemy be it immigrants or be it socialists or you know the if if you're using the the freedom of the market as as the primary thing that that's that is is a better unifying force because it's already closer to the status quo than trying to solve all of the problems in in the way mm. that the left has to do um and there are other there are other ideological factors and factors in how uh public perception of these um of, of the the different sides works but i think i think there's probably something like that at play here as well um, mm. that it's it's easier to maintain a sort of um clarity of and singularity of purpose than when you're trying to solve all the problems um but, like, but why but hang on but hold on but so but right leaning people they would say uh that they too are trying to solve all the problems of society but yet they can come up with a clarity of purpose like is there nothing that unites the left that is kind of like this is the, we may all have these things that we worry about, but this is the main thing. Like, we need to all get on board with this one thing. There has... Like, what is it about the left that makes it... Uh, that they they cannot have this sort of clarity of purpose? I think it's because it is a, a fundamental shift in how the society is run. Because, by default, when you're making the the the, the market the primary concern... 
like already our, our society is so focused towards that or it like towards the established power um you're you're just trying to find different ways to maintain the status quo to solve problems whereas the other approach is making a fundamental shift in how society is structured and changing what the status quo is so would would you postulate that if if ireland were for the past hundred ish years all governed under a left government that you would see the fracturing that we see on the left occur on the right uh possibly yes possibly mm. Interesting. So that so th- th- so that means there is nothing intrinsic about left leaning ideology that necessarily goes towards fracturing. It's just the way the way society has fallen that it leads that that it means that left parties are on that side of the spectrum that is um, conducive to splitting. Well, I mean, like right parties split as well, and there there is there is factionalism and and there is infighting but i just think there there's something about the the context that the, that ex- exists in which makes it less less damaging okay okay um, uh, i mean because like but, if you look I, I mean if you take examples um you had into split off from Sinn Fein, and they, they're kind of like what uh, the right wing faction within Sinn Fein was mm-hmm. um and they split off, so that's that's a, a, a right wing split, um, and you see it in say in because we don't we don't have a very strong electoral right uh, far right wing in in Ireland, no. um, like anti immigration and fascist platforms, like explicitly fascist platforms, don't do well in Ireland, um, but you you see it say in the UK the way that there's there's a load of different right wing groups there there's the yeah there's the BNP there's the EDL there's the UKIP there's and they have their own disputes and their own um, infights but they still they will pull together against immigration right they have that unifying thing yeah they have that unifying thing of it is foreigners that is the problem. Yeah, that that well, okay. I both say that makes sense, but I need people to be aware that, like, I don't mean that. Like, it makes sense that immigration is the problem. Like, it makes sense as in that's how their ideology would fall. Yeah, if that if that makes sense. It's got such tricky grounds talking about these things without like kind of slipping and saying the wrong things. Um, mm-hmm. Follow on question, right? The uh, I don't know if you saw the polls in the lead up to the election, but they they did a split. Um, they did polls. They polled eighteen to twenty four year olds, and then they polled sixty five year olds plus. Mm-hmm. And what they found was the eighteen to twenty four year olds heavily voted Sinn Fein, so heavily voted mm-hmm. left, and the sixty five year old plus group voted fifty fifty Fine Fall Fine Gael in accordance to the traditional civil war split. <laughs> yeah. My question here, Bill, like, and, and it is people of our generation and maybe even our parents' generation look at that group that will vote, like, based on historical uh, events and kind of go, that's a little bit silly. Like, I know people that think that. Um, mm-hmm. Is there an argument to be made that we, like millennials and the generation one older from us, are also falling into such a pattern with regards to Sinn Féin and this notion of their connection to terrorist organisations. Because it it could be seen, or at least the impression I get is that the 18 to 24 year olds came out and went, lads, like, can we all stop with this, like, uh, voting based on history? Like, we've had a hundred years of a centre right wing government. Let's try change. What is the most valid change option? That would be this left wing party. Uh, I do not care if they came from, if they supposedly came from terrorist roots back gener- a generation or two before I was born. I don't care. I'm just going to vote for them because that makes logical sense. And then we, our generation, Bill, you and I, like our millennials, there's a lot of people who in our generation utterly refuse to vote for them because of those historical norms. Are we, have we become the new 65 year old plus group? Are we entrenched, Bill? Oh, I see what you're saying. So instead of voting along civil war lines, it's whether or not to vote for a party along the, tr- the lines of the troubles. And never deviating from that, no matter never what de- the platform of that party is. I mean, yeah, it could in theory happen. Um, we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait 40 years and see. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but rather, do you think that that is what has happened? Like this is, it is only now that people have, that that a younger generation has come along and kicked us all up the bottom was like, 
this is what change is. Stop squabbling. You know, like we in practice over ever since we be, uh, were allowed to vote, we have always followed the attitude of you never vote Sinn Féin because they had terrorist uh, affiliations in the past. Don't ever look at their policies. It doesn't matter. The terrorism uh, thing well, is the biggest thing ever. I, I, I don't think that's... I mean, you've only said what, what 18 to 24 year olds voted, but I think Sinn Féin did quite well in our age category and the one older than us as well. They did, they did quite well in people in their 30s and 40s. Oh, did they? I think so, yeah. A- abnormally well, or just the regular... Yes. Ab- okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. So, so better, right. better than previously. Like, that 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 uh, vote share wasn't just 18 to 24-year-olds. That was, it was, like, several age categories. Okay. Um, and then final question. Final, final question. I promise I'll stop about this. Uh, I, I'm going to try and get your actual opinion here. If you don't want to give it uh, on air, that's entirely fine. And we'll just cut this bit and say goodbye. Okay. Uh, the... What is your honest take on the Sinn Féin thing? Like, they are now a party that has the potential to actually form a government at some stage. Um, d- does the terrorist link bother you? Do you think there is a terrorist link, uh, etc.? Are you worried? Like, what's what? What do you? How do you feel about them? Um, I don't like them. I don't why? trust them. Why? Why? And I don't. Uh, and I, I, I think it is too close to that history of violence. Um. And I won't vote for them. At the same time, at the same time, the the those deaths from political violence, everyone is worried about that, and there is talk about oh, all you know they they killed all these people, and they are, they have these links, and you know th- this violence is unforgivable, and there's investigations into it, and it's been discussed in the media, um. I I think that deaths from homelessness and deaths from uh, preventable deaths on hospital waiting lists and other deaths that are attributable to austerity are political violence every bit as much. And I think we should be critical of them and we should be very, very cautious of them and we should be 100% as cautious of centre-right parties who introduced and who maintained austerity. For the same reasons, because that is a form of political violence as well. I agree. I agree with what you're saying. Uh, Can you... Is your reason, your distrust of them, is it because of, just like you said, the closeness to the violence that occurred in, like, you know, the 80s or whatever? Is that that the only reason or is it the main reason or is there others? Um, That's as much as I'd like to say. Okay. All right. Because... I'm I'm really conflicted about them as well, man. Like there is like I do I do see that, right? And like I I remember a the, the, I remember the troubles. Like I was alive for the very tail end of the troubles. Like I remember my uh German grandmother calling us and being all like, I heard there was uh, a bomb went off in Northern Ireland. Is everyone okay there? And we have to, we had to always be like, We live in the Republic, it's okay. But I remember the sort of fear and I remember like going to dad and being all like, Are we okay? Like is there mm-hmm. a war? You know, like that is a thing in my living memory. So I do, ki- I do remember it. You know, like, and I do, you know, the idea that the Sinn Fein were the political wing of this organization that got increasingly more terrorist-like um, mm-hmm. does doesn't sit well with me. But at the same time, I look at their track record, uh, and I over the past generation, and I see no no terrorist uh, involvement. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the thing that people point out, they're like, oh, they're very critical of the special criminal court uh, because yeah. it's been it's been used to lock up the terrorists. Um, and that's an argument, but you can also say that they're critical of the special criminal court because it's kind of anti-democratic. And like if you were to pros- uh, propose the idea of a special criminal court to a person in the States, for example, they tell you to go away with your dictatorship, you know, because that doesn't exist over there. It's not a mm, well. <laughs> no, but like no, but the, no, let's let's not pretend like Chicago Chicago PD d- don't run a black site. Like, <laughs> oh, I, I don't I don't follow what. Um, the the Chicago Police Department uh, are known to have a black site where people are detained and are not given their rights. Yeah, certainly, okay. or certainly in the last few years, like <laughs> let's not <laughs> pretend that it, like, the, the, these 
um, undemocratic procedures don't occur in lots of places. No, that that's fair. That's fair. Uh, but what's going on there uh, is not. Oh, how do I explain this? Like, it's not. It's, it's a of, subversion of the intent of right. of the, the the governmental project. Whereas you're saying the special criminal court is an explicit component of the governmental project as it stands. Bingo. And if you were to propose gotcha. to to an American to be like, hey, we're going to set up a court in your land and we're going to make it a juryless court, court where three judges decide the fate of people. Uh, that is a thing that, as far as I'm aware, is completely alien to, to Americans and a lot of other countries around the world. And they would look at that with great suspicion because it is kind of inherently undemocratic. Now, no. th- there's an argument to be made that it's undemocratic for a safety reason. But that's, you know, that the, it's it's a complex issue. Um, yeah. So I would I would look at the Sinn Féin's attitude, or people would look at Sinn Féin's attitude towards the Special Criminal Court, not as a extension of their terrorist affiliations, but just as kind of their extension of their democratic will. Do you know? I see nothing in their, in their manifesto, because uh, I read the yeah. manifesto, <laughs> that was, that was explicit, that was not even explicit, but it was kind of worried me and made me fearful. Mm-hmm. Do you know? Like... Is this a boogeyman that we tell ourselves exists with regards to them that no longer does? I mean, there's a good response that I saw you know, saying to, to, to the idea that the Sinn Féin are, are, are run by the, the, the IRA Army Council. Um, that's, it's pretty cool that the IRA Army Council wants to build social housing. Right, exactly. <laughs> and did, did you know, I don't know if you read the manifesto, but do you know that Sinn Féin are also proposing two separate basic incomes? I'm not sure that I did know that. Basic income. Like, this is like, that's, basic incomes are like mega left. Like, they're proposing one for artists, which I could talk about at length because I think it's beautiful. Uh, And they're proposing one for all uh, people in the agriculture sector who are going to make a change to green uh, uh, production methods. Mm-hmm. as a way of kind of being all like listen hey we know that if you need to scrap your entire system of operating oh apologies alarm uh we hey we know that if you're going to have to scrap your entire system of how you conduct your farming we're going to sub you the money uh as you transition into green sectors you know we're going to sub you the cost of like putting up windmills and things like that and i was like wow like that's pretty cool that the terrorists are proposing basic income i like, guess it's not bad <laughs> So yeah, it's just it's just massively complex, and I can't. There's no right answer with these people. It's just it, it annoys me because I want the world to have black and white answers, but it doesn't. <laughs> um, yeah, that's Irish politics. That's Irish politics. Um, so solve the puzzle if you want internets. Uh, and have a read up on Irish history because I think it's fascinating. And have a read up as well on our political system because the actual mechanics of how we vote and things like that, PRS TV, is just is really fascinating. And I think if you're if you're a nerd like me. You'll it's really, really like it. Um, certainly, Zitnaf. When I talked to him, he had he he did like he embarked on a research project to in trying to solve this this puzzle. He learned about the Ra, the Provos. He learned about the Civil War. He learned about everything, <laughs> and so hopefully that would inspire similar learning in 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 artifacts. Yeah. Um, so anyway, with that, uh, let's end the show. Let's leave it there. Uh, so. Uh, Slán o Ália Mi gusti féin Uh Thanks you for Thanks for listening everyone uh, If you If you like what you hear uh, You should check out the Patreon And, and help support the show uh, You can go pick up some merch Links are in the description I need to make new merch That's the thing I'm going to do next month um, And as, oh yeah, as always Thank you for listening uh, Thanks for me and Bill For talking to me And uh, Until next time Edgar Edgar out, out. Thank you.